Hello everyone and welcome to today's SANS webcast, iOS Location Forensics. My name is Carol Auth of the SANS Institute and I will be moderating today's webcast. Today's featured speaker is Sarah Edwards, a Senior Digital Forensic Analyst. If during the webcast you have any questions for Sarah, please enter them into the questions window located on the GoToWebinar interface. We will be answering them during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. And with that, I'd like to hand the webcast over to Sarah. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, sorry for the uh, pre-start. Um, I got a couple of buttons confused, but in my defense, it truly does look like a screen when I'm screen sharing to start the broadcast. So again, my apologies. Uh, so let's get this thing going. So first up, we have it's iOS location forensics. I really think this is a very important topic, uh, mostly because there are a lot of different ways that this could be used in a lot of different investigations. You know, kidnapping investigations. Maybe you're looking to corroborate somebody's story where they had a certain place at a certain time. There's a lot of different ways we can use this information. So a little bit about myself. Um, I do have what I call two jobs. By day, I'm a government contractor with Parsons Corporation. I work in Northern Virginia. Um, I am hiring mobile forensic engineer. Please take a look at that link. Contact me in any way, shape, or form. I really need to hire somebody, and you work with me directly, which may or may not be a benefit considering if you want to work with me or not. Uh, by night, I am a SANS author and instructor. Um, I teach and author the Forensics 518 Mac Forensic Analysis class. Um, and you saw that on the previous screen. But I'll be teaching in a bunch of places this year. Um, in July, we got Austin, Texas at the DFER Summit, which is a fantastic time. It's one of my favorite, favorite classes to go to. Uh, Virginia Beach, if you like the beach, that is a great one to go to. Of course, Las Vegas. I'm actually broadcasting to you live from the NFUSE conference right now. Of course, I'm up in my room, otherwise it would be very, very loud. And in October, if you're looking for a, a fun trip to Europe, maybe you can get your, um, your, your people to pay for Prague. It's a wonderful city. It's a beautiful city to go to. Um, so at all times, I am a Mac nerd. Anybody who knows me, even for five minutes, could figure out that if it has a piece of fruit on it, I will throw money at it and purchase it. Um, I like to do this. I call it research. At least that's my excuse. Um, so I get to dig into a lot of different Mac, iOS, Apple TV, Apple Watch, anything um, to take a look, a forensic look at a lot of this stuff. I do have a blog out there, MacForensics.com, which these slides will be posted to maybe later on today, I'm hoping. Um, and feel free to contact me um, at um, my CSH email account as well as on Twitter. Um, frankly, Twitter will probably give you a quicker response than email, <laughs> just to put that out there. So a little bit about the scope of this presentation. We're going to be talking about a lot of native and third-party areas. I won't be talking a lot about um, every single place you could possibly find a geolocation type item, but I'm going to try to give you some hints, uh, some creative ways to look uh, for particular items. So I'm going to go through a few examples. Um, doing some creative word keyword searching. So I'm going to point out some keywords as well that you might want to just keyword search across the whole um, evidence um, area just to see if you get lucky and find a nice Latin long somewhere as well. Now there is a caveat to this. Depending on the type of acquisition you have, now in most cases it's going to be some sort of logical, um, maybe through Celebrate or X or Y or even an iOS backup, uh, but if you can get physical access through a jailbreak or any other means, then you might get extra data. And that jailbreak is going to give you a lot more data than you're originally going to have with just an iOS backup. But I'll get into that as the presentation goes along. So where do we start? OK, so there is this clients.plist file. And it's located you know, down into the private bar root library caches location D directory. And of course, I put a couple of different file paths on here because it does differ if you do have a physical acquisition versus an iOS backup. So what this file contains 
and you can see in the screenshot here, uh, it has a lot of these bundle IDs, these com.apple, the com.weather.twc, com.facebook.facebook. So each one of these is a bundle ID for a specific application or a specific um, internal iOS framework or application bundle. So if we're curious if a particular application actually has location services turned on and available for a certain application, this is where I would go to first. So when we open up um, on an actual iDevice, this location services pane from the privacy um, settings area. First off, you see this location settings. Ideally, that should be green, <laughs> excuse me, to be able to find a lot of location stuff. You're not going to find a ton of location information if they don't have location services turned on. And what location services is, is basically giving it access to your GPS location, to Wi-Fi location, so on and so forth. Now, each one of these applications in the screen here has a couple of different entries. You know, some are set to never use location services. Uh, while using the application, they're allowed to do so, or to always use location services. Now, certain apps you might want that always on. You know, um, I'm thinking Waze, for instance. I'll go over Waze in a little bit. Waze is a traffic application. You might want to have it so it's saying, oh, you know, your commute back home is going to be a little bit longer than normal. Maybe you want to take this other route. So if we go back to our client's plist file, and actually open up one. I have the com.wonderground weather underground application bundle here. We look in a couple of the different keys here. The one couple of ones that I'm going to point out is this authorization key. So this authorization key has a number associated with it. And I've listed a few in this uh, inset box up here. So it's either a one, a two, or a four. Don't ask me what a three is. I couldn't find any of mine that actually have a three. So weather underground, um, this application actually is set to always be on. So for a weather application that does a lot of location services and wants to show you your current weather where you currently are, it's going to have that set to always on. Now the other item in here I like to point out, location time stopped. So this is the last time that location services was actually used for this particular application. Now if we keep going down this uh, location services pane here, you see system services. Now system services is more internal to iOS. So in this pane, if you just select that one, you see a lot of different um, uh, frameworks, like find my iPhone. Of course that needs location services turned on if you need to find a lost iPhone. Um, motion calibration, uh, spotlight suggestions, um, Wi-Fi networking, there's a lot of different frameworks here that internal iOS services use for your location services. So a lot of those in the client's plist file, if they start with com.apple.location.d.whatever, those are these system services type data there. So let's start off with a few that you're probably going to start off with anyway. So if you're thinking location, you're probably going to go to Apple Maps. People, if they aren't using Google Maps, are likely using Apple Maps. Uh, so get your location, figure out where you're going. Do you want walking directions? Do you want driving directions? Um, this is a great place to start with. You know, people use this quite often to figure out where they want to go. So the first one I'm going to talk about, the first file, is geohistory.maps data. Now the thing with Mac and iOS is that everything is likely either a plist file or a SQLite database. And 95%, let's say, 95% of the data on these devices. So just because it doesn't have a plist file extension doesn't necessarily mean it's not a plist file. So if I take this file out, um, maybe I just have this file, I rename it to a plist file, and I can open it up in whatever plist viewer I want to open. So right now I'm using, uh, in this screenshots, I'm using Xcode to actually view some of this data. So we see this MSP history on the left-hand side here. Now this has a bunch of different items in here, but then I see just this data, this blob data. All right not really going to help me too much just looking at that. So I have to copy that out 
extract it, and throw it into a hex editor, which is what I've done on the right-hand side. Now on the right-hand side here, you can see, and I showed you the screen of what I'm actually viewing on the phone, is I see uh, recent searches for um, Sugar Shack Donuts in Northern Virginia. Uh, I look at District Taco, a couple of my favorite places. I want to go find some, some really healthy tacos and donuts. So if I go searching for those, what's being written to this actual data blob is a lot more than just where is it and what's it, uh, where is it located. Uh, so for, for instance, District Taco, if we look in this data blob file, you see a lot of Yelp type information. Yelp is integrated into Apple Maps to show them more information about you know, the type of place that you might be looking for. Now Sugar Shack, the example over here, you can see in the middle of the screen here that there's actually geolocation information in here. Now these are fairly proprietary data blobs. There is a certain structure, uh, but the structure is not documented, or at least I haven't found that documentation yet or have been able to document it myself. But you can see the strings in here. You see current location, um, United States, Virginia, Arlington, uh, zip code, Columbia Pike, Glebe Road. You can actually see the address that's going to. And if you see current location and an address, it's likely going to be some sort of directional type, uh, type of activity versus just a search for, say, District Taco, which is an excellent place. And I highly rec recommend both of these places if you're in the Northern Virginia area. So the next place where it's going to be pretty easy to get some good data, good location data, is photos. So everybody with their eye devices loves to take some photos. Now what a lot of people don't know is that if they have location services turned on on their devices, uh, location services for the photos or the camera application is also turned on by default. Now you can turn that on and off as you want, but you do have to go into settings and do that yourself. So a great place to look for location data is in photo EXIF data. So what you can go through here is go to that DSIM directory and go through all the folders, uh, excuse me, the files, and maybe use something like EXIF tool. I have an example of that in the lower left-hand side. EXIF tool is one of my favorite things to rip out EXIF data uh, from a lot of different files. So what I did in that example is I grepped it um, using the GPS keyword. So just give me all the GPS-related information. So I have, you know, not just Latin longs, but GPS timestamps, uh, bearing information, directions, speeds, so on and so forth. A lot of great locational data. Now you can do that across all the hundreds and hundreds of photos across the device. You're going to get a lot more information. Now on the right-hand side, if you don't want to use a command line tool, you can actually use native OS X tools. So I opened up this picture on my Mac um, using the preview um, application. If you go to the inspector, and it's uh, up in the menus, do file inspector, you can actually click on this more information tab, and there's two buttons. You can sort of see that in here. There's two little tabs, EXIF and GPS. Uh, so I click the GPS one, and it gives me a lot of that same information uh, showing me where this picture was taken. Now the photos. Uh, they also have a back-end database that a lot of that metadata is stored into. So if I look in this database, I might find some more location information. So we have the same image here. We have our image from San Francisco, this image 0079. So if I'm going through this database, and there's a few different tables you might want to look at. I'm just showing you one here as an example. So Z, additional asset attribute information. It shows a lot of different metadata items for this particular file. There is a column here called Z reverse location data. So what this lo reverse location data actually is, is reverse geolocation information. So it's taking that EXIF data, it's doing a reverse geolocation of it, and providing you an ASCII version of that location. Uh, so this, I guess, is um, looking in the actual blob data in this inset screenshot here, is Broderick Street, San Francisco, and it shows you the neighborhood, the Pacific Heights neighborhood, uh, shows you some county information, street, uh, state, 
all sorts of really good geolocation type data. So even if you maybe don't want to go through all the pictures itself, you can actually scrape the database for a lot of the same data. Now another easy place to find quick location um, information, this is very true for me. Uh, I fly on United, <coughs> excuse me, I fly on United a lot. Um, every time I fly on United, I get the tickets uh, printed into my um, the iOS wallet or the passes, depending on which iOS version you're using. Unfortunately, I'm kind of a digital hoarder, and I never actually delete these items. So they tend to stay around for a long time. Uh, I've actually had a case uh, a, a while back where I had a United 1K um, phone that I was looking at, and this person had literally thousands of different airline tickets, and I was able to correlate all that information of potential flights that they were going to go on. Now, you don't know if they actually went on this flight for sure, but it gives you a good idea of where the person might have been traveling at a certain time and where. Of course, you can correlate that back with other data if need be. So these uh, ticket files are stored in the passes cards directory. They're stored as PK pass directory files. So notice the D on the left hand side here that stands for directory in the Unix file system. And we get this PK pass files. So if I go into one of these files, take a closer look at the information stored in there. So in this directory, there's a lot of different pings, some JSON files, uh, DB, uh, SQLite database information. But what I'm really interested in is that pass.json file. And it's a JSON-based file. I've sort of put a few of the little screenshots here showing you what kind of data it contains, uh, when the flight was, what seat they were assigned to, their boarding group, um, uh, origination and destination locations, you know, premier access, their mileage plus number if you need that type of information. So while not completely Latin long type information, you still get a good idea of where they may have been traveling to and from. So now I'd like to dive into some third-party applications. Of course, I can't go into every third-party application, so I'm going to pick just a few that have some interesting data that we can look at. So Waze is a very, very popular crowdsourcing traffic application. I actually started using this mostly first just for research. But I've actually started using it a lot in my daily life. I have a very long commute in the DC area. Um, so I've actually found it to be extremely useful um, to find out where accidents are, where I'm going to hit traffic, uh, you know, where the cops are, of course. So it does tend to be very, very useful. And of course, it does track your location. It has to track your location. <coughs> so in the session file, this is just a plain text file. No parsing needed, just open it up in a text viewer of some sort. So this session file contains all sorts of different location type information, a ton of different stuff. Showed you a few of them here. Now, I had to do a lot of redaction. A lot of this is my own personal information, so I apologize for all the little black bobs. Uh, but frankly, I don't want you guys knowing exactly where I live and exactly where I work. Um, but you can get the general idea of these GPS locations. Uh, so, for instance, we look at the GPS dot position. You know, this this is showing certain GPS positional information. But if you notice, now we usually store a Latin long as latitude first, longitude second. I don't know if that's an international standard, but as it's stored in in the um, ways information, it's actually storing it backwards. So it's actually longitude first and then latitude. I think if you, you know, input this into um, Google Maps, you'll actually end up somewhere in the Indian Ocean. So if you throw it into your mapping application, it doesn't quite make sense. Make sure you have it in the right order. So I'd probably just flip those to make sense of it. Now another thing with Waze. Waze is originally an Israeli application. So it's a default um, positioning, I guess you can call it, is Tel Aviv, Israel. So make sure you note this. Uh, make sure you do research on your applications. If you question anything about location, do your own research. Test, test, test. So this work position here, I input my home um, here, and that's at negative 77 and 38. 
but my work position I never actually filled into the application. But it has a default value in here that throws me right directly into Tel Aviv, Israel. I can assure you, I do not work in Israel. That would be more of a long commute than I even deal with right now. Um, so definitely take note of that. If it seems strange, test it. Now the Waze user.db file. This shows us some, some nice information in a SQLite database format. So here we're looking at the places table. So the places table is actually showing us um, certain locations that have either been placed in here by, um, by the user themselves, so their home or their work address, or certain locations that they've looked up. So in this case, I put in my home address, and that's the item number ID 1. That's the one that's been redacted. And the second address is Wegmans. I wanted to go, you know, go grocery shopping. Wegmans is the best grocery store in the world, and I will fight that to the death if anybody, you know, has any uh, other ideas. So I had to go grocery shopping. So you put that in the Waze application, and of course, as a mapping application does, it brings you right to there. It also has Latin longs for all that good data as well. Uh, I got a question here. Can you see again which util is being used for SQLite files? Uh, so in my screenshots, I'm using the SQLite database browser. Um, it's free. It's I think if you just do a Google search for SQLite database browser, it should pop up as one of the first links. Uh, it's one of my preferred tools to uh, to do a lot of SQLite stuff. So. Next, <laughs> and I just got a bunch of comments about Piggly Wiggly is better than Wegmans. All right, I haven't been to a Piggly Wiggly. I will try, I promise. All right, so next application we have is Glimpse. Now this one I don't think is as popular uh, to a lot of people, but I've actually been using it for years. Um, I really like this one. It is a location sharing app. So what I use this one for is I'm on my commute home, you know, it takes me an hour, hour and a half, depending on the traffic. I set it up and I share it with my husband. So he knows where I am and perhaps, you know, when I get to a certain point, he can start making dinner or something like that. I have a really great husband. I have a long commute and he knows that. It works out really, really well. Uh, so on long trips, I used to use this when I would um, visit my parents. So I would drive, you know, to upstate New York to visit my parents so they could see me on my journey as I travel up the you know 95 corridor to see where I'm at at a certain period of time. Uh, it is a really great application to use. And of course, it does also store location information. So Glimpse is storing its information mostly in JSON files, uh, which is, you know, each application stores its data in its own special way. I like to say each application is its own special snowflake. Um, so Glimpse stores it in JSON. So I have a couple of uh, examples here of the places underscore v2.dat file. Um, so this one is storing each time I put in a certain address. So I, can, I don't have to put in an address, but if I do, it's going to be recorded in this file. Uh, so I was looking for directions to a bakery called Bake Shop, which is also very excellent, I might add, and a few other places in the Northern Virginia area. So I can get myself and show that I'm tracking there to whomever I've shared my location with. Now this information is also being stored in image cache. So if I go to the previous slide, you see this image URL here. I'm looking at the second one down. It shows glimpse dash place and a Latin long. So it's actually storing Latin long information within a file name which is, you know, kind of useful. So it's uh, easy to spot those Latin longs in there. Um, so if you don't just get the information out of the JSON file, maybe you can look at the file names of these, you know, application files to get a lot of that same information.
Sarah, I think we've lost sound. Can you hear me? Oh, up? Sorry. Okay, there you I go. Hit the mute. Yep, I hit, hit the mute button. Was okay. it just at the beginning of the slide? Uh, it's maybe about a minute, less than a minute. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to start off with this slide. I don't know if you caught all of that. So the Wonderground application. This application um, is, is great for looking up different weather information. Uh, so I wanted to look up my weather in Arlington, Virginia. Um, I was in Arlington, Virginia. It's been raining for days and days and days. I was curious of when this rain was going to stop. Um, so I looked up that Arlington, Virginia screenshot there. I was also curious what the Vegas weather was going to be since I knew I was going to be out here this week. So I was fortunate to see that, okay, it's 77 and sunny. So there's a big difference in the applications here. Now the two screenshots I have up here. There is this tiny little, and I don't know if you can see my cursor or not, but near Arlington, Virginia, there's this tiny little um, location icon here that's filled in. Um, that's showing me within the application itself that it's using my current GPS location to get that information versus the other screenshot where I'm just searching it and it's pulling it from you know internet resources. So let's take a look at some of this data. Now Weather Underground has actually changed a little bit in the last few versions or so and a lot of applications do this all the time. So I do have newer information as well as older information. But what I'm actually curious here is the preferences file, so the configuration file for this application. Now the newer one is stored in group.com.wonderground.widgets.plist. The older one is stored in com.weatherunderground.plist. So each one has fairly similar information, just stored in a slightly different way. So each time I'm looking up my weather for my current location, it's storing a lot of that Latin long type information of where I'm currently at or where the nearest weather station might be. So I have an example of one on the right hand side here. Now this is an a example of the older one, but you can see the recent searches of where I've looked up weather and of course the, uh, the Latin longs associated with each one. Uh, the newer one uses a um, what's called an NSKeyed archive binary plist, which if you've ever never looked at one before, you're gonna you're gonna know it right when you see it because it has no context. It has the keyword NS keyed archiver in there, and it's not gonna make any sense to you. Um, I do have a great blog article on my blog that shows you how to parse those manually. Um, it's not a fun thing to do, uh, but it is possible. So talk about Weather Underground, I'm also going to show you um, the, or talk about the snapshots directory. Now I'd like to say something about snapshots directory. This is not just for the Wonderground application. This is for every application on the iOS device. So every time an application is either put into the background or it's got, gotten screen locked or something like that, it's actually taking a screenshot, and iOS is taking an internal screenshot of what the user is seeing and storing that in this snapshots directory so we can later bring it up. It, I guess it makes it appear to the user as it's loading faster or something like that. But we can actually use it in a forensic sense as well to see exactly what the user saw at any given time. So I've actually looked at the one for uh, Weather Underground and you can see that I'm actually looking in my current location, you can note, note that by the, um, uh, by the little location icon is Arlington or um, what is it, the Ashton um, Heights. Uh, so I, Ashton Heights was at my current location at this time. So it's just the neighborhood um, that it was uh, showing to me as. And this was just in Arlington, Virginia. So if you take these little ping files, open them up in any viewer, you can actually see exactly what the user saw. Now I can't guarantee that this is going to be very useful in every single application, but you might get lucky here. Some of this stuff is really, really golden data. So next up, we have the SQLite database for underground, Weather Underground. So this CacheDB files. Uh, so CacheDB databases, each application has their own CacheDB. And I'm actually going to show it to you in a few other um, applications as well. This one is really good for looking at, uh, seeing for temporary, temporarily stored data or cached data. 
So every application has to store some data um, just temporarily, and a lot of that stuff is stored in this cache.db database. It's a standard database across all applications. And it's basically showing network requests going back and forth. Uh, so what Weather Underground does is every time I look up a certain um, city or look at my current location's weather, it's sending out information to the Weather Underground API and doing a lookup on my Latin logs, which you can see in the screenshot below. So you can see a lot of these Latin logs, the 38s and the negative 77s, you know, those are the geolocations uh, for Arlington, Virginia. So you can actually strip a lot of that information out and use it in a forensic investigation as well. Not every single application stores it this way, it's just the way Weather Underground API actually works. But you really got to get creative when you're looking for location-based information. Next up, we have RunKeeper. I'm just going to throw that out right now. I am not a runner. So if these times look really bad to you, it's because I was walking. Um, I do not like to run unless being chased. Um, so RunKeeper is an exercise tracking application. Um, you go for a run, you track it. It's tracking the run, where, where did you go, you know, the altitude, how long, and certain other health-related stats as well. So the RunKeeper uh, SQLite file stores all the locations for all your runs. Oh, this one is fantastic. So it's going to store this information for a very, very long time because the user wants that information stored for a long time so they can track um, each particular run that they go on. So in this points table up here in the middle, we see a trip ID column. This trip ID column is basically saying, all right, which run did you go on? Now this is trip ID 2, so I can go to the trips table, look for trip ID 2 and get the start time uh, for that particular run. So if I sort the points table just by trip ID 2, I get every single Latin long for that whole running excursion or walking excursion that I did. And if I really wanted to, I can go back out, take that out, plot it, and actually look at that raw information in a nicer to view format. And I'll show you that in a couple of different areas a little bit later on. Next up, we're going back to native. So we have a couple of applications. We have Find My Phone and Find My Friends. So these are internal iDevice applications. So the Find My Phone is basically an application that allows you to find your phone if you say left it in a taxi or you forgot it at home and you want to make sure it's there or you forget it at the local restaurant. Um, so you bring up this application and I show you mine on the left hand side here. I got a Mac Mini called Byte. Um, I'm actually looking at it on my iPhone 6 and I have a few other um, uh, laptops here that just haven't pinged out quite yet. So uh, yesterday I was at the um, airport. I want to say, oh, uh, where are my computers right now? So if I look up Find My Phone, I can see, okay, this location for this particular Mac Mini, which is sitting on my desk at home, is still on my desk at home. So it's actually communicating back and forth uh, with that device or with Apple services to find that specific device. Now on the right-hand side here, we see this JSON type of information here. So the cache DB again, not just stores um, network information, but also what came back from that network request. In this case, what came back is JSON information. You know, so uh, is this device, um, what is the display name, uh, battery status, you know, for, for uh, some systems they might not have a battery status. What is the name of the device? I call my phone, my phone six. Um, the timestamp uh, that it came back. Uh, position type information, we'll talk a little bit about uh, position types a little bit later on in the presentation, but this one is using straight up GPS. And of course the Latin longs of exactly where that location is at a given time. So different types of data sort in different ways. You've got to be, uh, you've got to keep your eyes open for this type of information. Now you can do the same things with find your friends. Um, so I have a few friends here and you have to 
you know, send them an invitation, say, hey, you want to track my location, I'll track your location, uh, let's be phone tracking friends, and you can track them as they go along throughout their day. So I have a few friends here, a few other SANS instructors, and of course I'm tracking. Now Cindy and Heather I couldn't find. That was, that, was, that was unfortunate, but Phil I saw was sitting at home. That's great. And at this point, it was 103 miles from me. Uh, so he lives in Delaware. However, I was tracking him earlier in that week. So that's the screenshot on the right-hand side. He was teaching in Australia at this time. So I'm like, yeah, got to make some good screenshots. He's in Australia. Let's see where he's at. What is he doing? So I don't know if that's the exact address of the hotel that he was teaching at, but it probably looks pretty close. So it's kind of a creepy way to track your friends. Very, very useful. Or kids, you know, family members, what have you. So if I look at some of the CacheDB information, there's actually information in here that has been deleted or no longer available. Um, so if I guess that's why I give you the hex version of it here. So I'm going through here, if you just do a search for things like location or lat, long, um, um, addresses and things, you can actually go through these databases and find a lot of older information. Now the locations that I'm showing you here was actually where we were located way back in October. Um, so I took this data yesterday. Um, so this data was from October but still hanging out in that database. Um, so we do see some uh, timestamps up here. These are actually current timestamps of, I believe it was yesterday or the day before. Uh, but I don't show you a little bit lower down because I'm redacting a little bit of uh, personal identifiable information. Uh, but it does have the, uh, the timestamp of when um, Phil and I were in Prague teaching there as well. And that was back in October. So make sure some timestamps make sense with a lot of your other correlated data. And this is JSON. You could actually just take this whole block out, throw it into a nice text editor that does JSON really well, and actually view it in a little nicer format. Okay, frequent locations. This is to where we're getting into the really juicy stuff. Uh, this is where you really do need physical access to the device, um, usually by a jailbreak of some sort. Um, these are extra protected files. The Apple does not allow you to get to them in a backup of any sort. Uh, but this is really, really good stuff. This is some of my favorite information um, out there right now. Um, so if you do have your iPhone or an iDevice sitting with you right now, if you go to your settings, uh, privacy, location services, system services, and finally frequent locations, you'll see a lot of frequent and recent locations um, that you've been at. Now this is how, like in the screenshot that I'm showing you to the right here, it, my iPhone knows my commute. I haven't told it my commute, but it looks at my locations throughout the day and actually does a pattern of life analysis on it. So it knows that, okay, I'm leaving. And it knows I'm already going back to Arlington or likely going back there. And it's saying, hey, traffic is unusually heavy right now. That's kind of creepy, Apple, but thank you very much for that notification. So how does it know this information and how does it store it? So just to show you, now if you're looking at yours, yours is of course going to be a little bit different than mine in these screenshots. If I go to system services, look at frequent locations, first off, it's going to be on by default unless the user has actually turned it off or actually doesn't use location services at all. So I have a few history items in here. Of course, I've been to Arlington, Virginia, and DC, uh, Stafford, Virginia, uh, taught in Florida, and visited California and Washington uh, during this time frame. So I can click on these and actually get more information. So if I click on California and Washington, I visited South Disneyland Drive, South 176th Street and Airport Drive or Airport Way. So I'm going to click South Disneyland. I taught in Anaheim in February. Going a little bit further, it shows you the exact times. Well, not exactly. The um, very, very close to being exact. Within about 15 minutes or so, um, the exact times I was located 
uh, this is where the hotel was on South Disneyland Drive that I was teaching at. Um, and the times associated with that in more detail. So that's really, really great information. So this data is being used or stored by a process called Routine D, the Routine Daemon. Um, so everywhere I'm traveling to, everywhere I walk, it's constantly querying where I'm at at any given time. So it's storing this information in this cache encrypted B database. Now this is located in the location D directory. But if you have an iOS backup, you still might have that location D directory, but you won't have this file. It is extra protected. You must have physical access to get it. <coughs> Excuse me. So if I did a little query here, this is a nice SQLite query, just showing me um, um, show me the time stamps at a certain time, the last and longs, altitude, horizontal accuracy, and so on and so forth from the location um, table. So I have on, what, April 12th, a lot of this information from 8 o'clock in the morning to about 8.09. Now the data retention here. This is a big one. A few of you might remember uh, a few years ago there was this location debacle with the consolidated DB database that stored very, very similar information but kept it for a lot longer time. So it's still storing that information because Apple still wants to help you, you know, figure out your routine and show you different pop-ups and things like that. But this data in this database is only going to be stored for about a day. But I'll show you a little bit later on where that's stored for a little bit longer. So this location information, you know, uh, timestamps tend to be accurate from all the research that I've done. Uh, GPS location is also fairly accurate for as much as GPS is accurate within a city. So what I can do here is I can take this information and plot it out. So I've taken this, the data points shown to you on the previous screen and actually plotted it out. And what you're seeing here, I'm using Google My Maps to plot this information. But you're actually seeing the beginning of my commute. So I'm starting off in Arlington and going up Wilson Boulevard, going down Washington Boulevard, right past Fort Myer, right past Arlington National Cemetery, <coughs> and then finally getting onto 395 to head south for my nice long commute. That is really great information to have. You get to see this, you know, a, a, a potential person's commute or drive to work, uh, drive to home, drive to the grocery store, you know, whatever could be part of your investigation. So I made a, um, <clears throat> excuse me, there is also a couple of other files in this com apple routine d directory. These are called state model files. Uh, so there's a one and two. Uh, they both contain nearly about the same information. I haven't quite figured out why there's a couple files there. So state model one or two. This is storing the frequent locations that you've actually sh was shown uh, previously. So my trips to uh, Seattle, to California, um, my trips to Arlington, so on and so forth. Now these are plist files, but they're the NS Keyed Archiver plist files. These are terrible plist files to look at. So what I did is I actually created a script, and the link is shown to you on the on the uh, on the slide here, to actually parse this information in a more human-friendly type format. Um, and you're able actually able to get a couple of different outputs at this time. Uh, I give you a KML output, which is shown to you in the screenshot. So KML output you can import into uh, Google Earth or any other mapping type uh, program. And I'll actually show you the plot points of where each location was. A CSV output and a textual output that I'll show you on the next slide. So I'm parsing this information. Now each entry, or excuse me, each location will have a few different items associated. So I have some hex output here. This is the geolocation lookup. So you see things like Clarendon Boulevard, United States, Virginia, Arlington, all that geo location type information. Now on the right hand side we have the actual location type data, the Latin longs certainty. Uh, each time you visit that location you'll have a visit entry in here so you might have more than one visit. Uh, for this particular one I only visited one time but if it was my house 
I'd probably have a few more than that. So I visit that, of course, just about every single day if I can make it. And then you have transition information. So that's leaving and exiting a certain property at a certain time. So a lot of different data is stored in these, uh, these state model archive files. So while that database, that encrypted um, cache uh, B database, is only storing that information for one day, if we look at these state model archive files, we're actually getting the information stored for a lot longer. It's just selectively storing you know, frequent and recent locations. So not everything, but actually a very good portion of it. Next database we have, which again is another protected database, is this cache encrypted A or lock cache encrypted A uh, databases. Again, both SQLite databases contain just about the same information. Um, but what this is storing is um, cell locations. It actually stores a lot of different cellular type locations. So if you're on LTE or CDMA or doing uh, certain Wi-Fi information, each table stores specific information according to how it's being uh, presented uh, to the device. So I'm showing you one from the LTE cell location table. Again, it has timestamp information, Latin longs, and we also have a lot of extra information. So MCC, MNC, tax, CI, URF, CN, I'm told I'm not a cellular engineer at all, but um, this information, I guess, is related to the actual cell site um, that that information was provided from. So potentially, you could go figure out which you know, cell tower they were uh, close to at any given time. So of course, I can take this information as well and map it. And I've actually done that here. So. This is a, an example from, um, from last month that I did. So my actual location, where I physically knew that I was at a certain point in time, is that yellow um, drop point there. So I was in the middle of DC, downtown DC. Now these cell locations are the red blobs. So these are the cell towers that my phone was communicating with. Now this is more of a general location. So before with the frequent locations, or the routine D information, it was a little bit more exact. This is a bit more general. So I wasn't exactly, you know, say in Pentagon City, the lower left-hand corner at this particular time. But you know I was at, at least within that DC area. Now Wi-Fi locations. So um, another database. So Wi-Fi wi locations is actually almost doing a, um, um, what's it called? Uh, um, I'm losing the name for it. Uh, war driving, I guess you can say. Um, doing personal internal iOS war driving and actually looking at all the Wi-Fi access points um, wherever you are at a given point in time. And it's storing the information for these access points as well. Again, with a timestamp and a Latin long of where it saw them. So this Mac this uh, machine address here looks a little bit different from probably what you're used to seeing. You know, six octets separated by colons. This is a base 10 MAC address. Why Apple does this? I have absolutely no idea, but they do. So, okay, we could take that information. We do have a Latin long to see where they're actually at. We can take that base 10 MAC address and I'm using the calculator application from OS 10 here. So I'm taking that base 10, throwing it into my calculator, and in the screenshot here, I'm clicking the little base 10 button. If I want to translate that to base 16, which we're all used to seeing it as, I just select the little 16 tab over on the right-hand side, and boom, I get my actual MAC address that I'm used to seeing. All right, now what do I do with this MAC address? I can query it. Um, so I use a service called wiggle.net to do some of these querying, uh, queries. There is a, a few different other, other services out there. But what wiggle.net is doing is that it's storing war driving information from a lot of different users and actually storing it in a very large backend database. So I can search for that uh, MAC address and I've thrown it into the screenshot here. 
and just to see, you know, what's what was the actual SSID called? Where, you know, does the Latin longs match up to where a person saw it? Um, and this one is just OAS underscore open. So some some access point in the middle of DC somewhere. So coming soon is a location scraper script. So all that really great information that I showed you before, the cellulars, the LTEs, the Wi-Fi, all that good database stuff. I'm actually writing a script right now. I'm actually rewriting it. Um, to actually parse and scrape all that information out there to put into a KML format or a CSV um, so you can actually plot it very easily without actually having to go back manually and do it yourself. Um, so, you know, if you need it now, just send me an email. Um, hopefully you can maybe wait a week or two while I work on it in just a little bit to make it even better. Um, but I will release it soon on my GitHub page where that other location script was as well for the routine D, the frequent location information. All right, so I showed you a lot of different areas to look for locations. It's stored in a lot of different ways. It's stored in a lot of different file types. It's stored in, you know, sometimes you just get addresses. Sometimes you get, you know, very specific Latin longs. What if you're not finding that information that you need? So what I've done, and I've done this for previous cases before, do a hail, you know, hail Mary keyword search. Looked at a lot of different keywords here. Latin long are very popular to store uh, with that certain data. Sometimes you see just lat and long, uh, latitude or longitude, or lawn, or GPS, or coordinate, or geo. You know, you are going to get a ton, tons of false positives here. Uh, but it's at least worth going to and maybe finding certain applications that store it in just a slightly different way than what I've showed you already. A couple of other things that I like to do. If you actually know a location of interest, you're curious if this person or this device you know, entered that location, look up the coordinates of that location. Now use the most generic ones you can to get the general area. So say I'm looking for Arlington, I'm going to use 38 and dash uh, negative 77 or look for specific address information. So we're not just looking for Latin long information. Sometimes it's being stored as reverse geolocated type data. So look for addresses, look for names of streets, towns, counties. You know, it depends on how specific you want to get there. But iOS devices really do contain a ton of location type data. Um, assuming that they do, of course, have location services turned on. Because if they don't, you're probably not going to find a whole lot of data in there. I'm not saying there might not be any, but it's going to be a heck of a lot less. So that is it for the presentation. Uh, thank you for attending. Uh, just a couple of notes before I start answering some of your questions that I've been seeing pop up. Um, if you're curious in attending the Forensics uh, 518 class, I'd love to see you. I'd love to have you in class. Um, Austin, Texas, Virginia Beach. Uh, Vegas and Prague are currently on the schedule. If you have any questions, uh, please feel free to contact me. I can't guarantee I'll you know, be able to contact you immediately back, but I will do my best to get that to you. Um, Twitter, I'm I am EVL Twin, and my blog, of course, where I'm going to try to post these slides soon, is going to be at MacForensics.com. Um, and vote for me if you like. Um, I am up for the Forensic Forecast Award Investigator of the Year. Um, so if you like the work that I do, you like the, the scripts that I put out, the presentations, you know, I feel very appreciative if you could uh, throw a vote my way. All right, so let me get to some of these questions here. I'm just trying to wiggle out the ones that say, oh, I lost the sound. Sorry, I wasn't looking. Oh, I see a lot of vote Sarahs. That's good to see. Let's see, can these techniques and practices be applied to Android devices as well? Uh, absolutely. So my day job actually consists of looking at mobile devices on the whole. So I do a lot of iOS and Android. Um, same techniques, absolutely. Um, they're going to have their own databases as well. They have a lot of the same features. It's just going to be stored in a slightly different way. Um, so I haven't gone into the um, detail level that I have on iOS. Um, just because I'm an 
iPhone person, not an Android person, but I can imagine that a lot of these same techniques and file file types, I bet you Waze might store the same information in the Waze application for Android as well. Uh, so definitely take a look at that. Thank you for your question. Uh, will there ever be a Forensics 518 cert? Uh, that's a good question. Um, we don't know right now. Um, so there's a lot of stuff that goes into going into a cert, uh, a lot of time, a lot of investment. Um, if you ever have questions for certs, contact the GIAC folks. Um, I think the website is giac.org, G-I-A-C.org. Um, the more people who request it, the better off chances that there is going to be a cert soon. I, hope, I really do hope there is a cert soon. Will, CPE, will the CPE certificate be delivered via email? Um, Carol, maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the certificate shows up in your SANS portal account? That is correct. I'll send out Thank a message you. in chat regarding that. Um, for the question, does this information remain after forgetting the network? Um, so I'm going to assume that this question was for the Wi-Fi network information. Uh, so the, it's collecting Wi-Fi network information, but you don't actually have to connect to the network. It's doing it completely permissively. Um, so it's just, if I'm sitting in my hotel room right now in Las Vegas, whatever access points are around me, even though I'm not connecting to them, it's actually storing a lot of that information. Another question here. I was curious if given a cell phone number, if, if given a cell phone in airplane mode, is location tracking still possible for many of these applications? I believe, though I might have to check on this, I believe if you have a cell phone in airplane mode, it's turning off the GPS and Wi-Fi radios. So you're still going to have location information. It's not turning off location services itself. It's just temporarily disabling it. So I believe a lot of that data is still going to be stored in there. It's just not going to be stored during that time period that you have uh, the airplane mode turned on. Can I recommend a good JSON viewer? Uh, there's a few out there. Um, I used to use Text Wrangler with, um, there's a little Python script. If you just go uh, Google tidy, uh, tidy JSON and Text Wrangler, there's a little Python script that you can use internal to Text Wrangler to use that. Uh, there's also this Chrome extension <coughs> uh, that I just found out yesterday from a colleague of mine uh, that is great too. I'm trying to remember the name of it. Um, I think if you just look up JSON formatter in the Chrome extension um, toolbar, you might be able to find that one. I really like that one. I think that one is my new favorite. Uh, another question here, if you're on a family account, can you track um, track your family using the Find My Phone too? Oh yes, oh, not a question, just a statement. Yes, absolutely. Track your family, track your kids. Why not? They have your Apple devices anyway, you might as well track them. Somebody said, I walk slowly, thank you. I was walking with my elderly mother, for the record. Uh, what else? All these P lists, is there a standard format for them or is it really up to the third party programmers? All right, so there are two different types of P lists and they are, they are standardized formats. There is an XML version which is less used now. Um, now they are using a binary P list version. Now there's a couple of different versions of the binary P list. Uh, there's the binary P list that you can open up and you have the keys and the values and everything makes sense and there's context. Or you have these NS keyed archive P lists, which are just awful to look at. Um, basically, you're going to see this NS keyed archiver uh, keyword and then item 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, so on and so forth uh, with not a whole lot of context to them. Um, definitely, if you're interested in seeing an example of one of these, uh, take a look at my blog article on how to parse them manually. Um, because I think it's really important to put context to keys and values and not just guess because they happen to be close together. Let me see if I have any more questions here. I think that might be it.
All right, I think that's it, folks. Well, do I have any other questions since I started answering them? Let me go back down the list here. Good call in District Taco. Yes, thank you, sir. You know what? I think we're out of time anyway, Why? Sarah. Oh, all right. <laughs> thank well, you. Thank you very much. If you got more questions, please email me. All right, great. Thank you so much, Sarah, for your great presentation, which helps bring this content to the SANS community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, you can visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast.